So what is the benefits of this? Um, and what's the disadvantages? First, let's look at the disadvantage for specific workloads um, which have um, many writes to one file involved, many writes to one huge file involved. Um, copy on write has disadvantages because you very often um, cop um, replace one block in between of the huge size and you create defragmentation uh, on a fragmentation on the disk. Uh, and this is one of the disadvantages all copy on write file systems share. Um, so it's not only ButterFS, but also all file systems which use copy on write have this issue. On the other hand, you have advantages which are relevant why we are looking at copy on write file systems. One is that you have efficient storage because um, if you have uh, if you have copy on write, you can um, design the write patterns according to this copy on write functionality. You can do deduplication on the disk because you have information about these um, blocks, how they are changed. You always have multiple versions of these blocks on the disk, and then you can run deduplication attached to these. You can synchronize, and if a file deviates, then just another co new copy is um, created. Based on the copy on write, you can implement snapshotting on the disk, uh, snapshots directly uh, in the file system. And to enable this, and this is also one of the benefits in ButterFS, um, that you have directly attached um, to the blocks of data and metadata, um, you have integrity checks. And these integrity checks are also used for building the tree internally to ButterFS. And um, so you have this beyond what is possible with journaling. Come to that point later on when we talk about XFS a bit. Now, let's come to our question that I started with. What does this, this, and this have in common? And what is, what is this relevant for our topic here? Um, so this is obviously cows, um, copy on write, and cow. Um, you see the similarity in the naming. This is butter, very obviously, and this is a bee tree. Uh, so the, um, the construction of a bee tree, a very simple one. Um, if you go online, you find where these pictures come from. So it's from Wikipedia or my own. Um, now, we have butter, we have cow. Cows produce milk. You produce butter from milk, and this is why butter comes from the cow, and this is why ButterFS comes from cow, and why we say ButterFS. So that's the right pronunciation, and this is how the inventor of ButterFS explained it to me, because butter comes from the cow, it is called ButterFS. Not BetterFS, not B3FS, it's ButterFS. Very simple to remember. Let's look at the main features and concepts of ButterFS. The first one is extends. Uh, so this is how the blocks are um, organized on the disk. Uh, extends is nothing special to ButterFS. Also, other file systems use extends. We already talked about copy on write as a major uh, principle of ButterFS. And based on these copy on write, we also have snapshots, which I will uh, demonstrate and talk about later. Sorry for that. Um, the concepts underlying of ButterFS is the B tree. I already talked about this. So everything, every organizational structure in ButterFS is using B trees. And the benefit of this is that you only implement a B tree infrastructure and B tree algorithms once. And you reuse them for everything that you do. You use it for free blocks, free block list, for metadata blocks, for a list, sorry, for data lists. Uh, and you, the whole file system is organized around these B trees, as we have seen part of the name. Another concept which is important to have in mind is that you have something called subvolumes. A subvolume, as a simple imagination, is a file system which in, within the file system. So, um, however, it looks like a directory. So, imagine a directory in your file tree, in your tree of the file system. But it is not really a directory. But at this point in time, which you access like a directory, 
a new file system begins, so a new set of these trees I was just talking about. It's virtually mounted into, so you don't see that it is mounted, but you can also work with this like a mount point. I already talked about metadata and data. We have a separation of metadata and data in all file systems. Um, the organization here is important because uh, metadata integrity is important for the um, survival of the ButterFS file system. It has one interesting feature in this uh, data uh, construction, and this is that from every extent back to the inode, uh, you have also a pointer in the file system. Normal file systems have a top-down architecture. You have an inode, and then you have a list of blocks or extents, and from those, you have from top-down, you have a pointer to your extent or to your block. In ButterFS, you also have back pointers, so that from every uh, point of data on the disk, you can find out where it belongs to, and that's one of the um, reliability functionality and features of ButterFS that it makes use of in case it would crash. It hopefully never does, though. Let's go back to this uh, overview. Um, we have, as I said, XFS, EXT4, and ButterFS as the primary file systems which are currently promoted by distributions, people, companies, and so on. We have in the market EXT2 and 3 and RiseFS as well. Uh, both are not bad file systems. Please don't misunderstand me. They are just not as modern anymore and don't have all the functionality that people need. In the announcement of this presentation, uh, we also said that uh, we would go down and describe how to choose the right file system. Now, a preface to that. I had the option and I thought about that to um, give you benchmarks or overviews of benchmarks and I decided not to do, to do so. The reason for that is that every benchmark is wrong for you. And the reason is that a benchmark always have to be, has to be done in the context of the storage, the hardware, and the workload that it should run to. There are artificial benchmarks, yes, but those artificial benchmarks or synthetic ben benchmarks are not always the right thing to do. So my advice, if you, before you choose a file system, do a benchmark with your application in your environment, and then you, then you may decide. From a SUSE perspective, and this is what I'm talking about, we have a preference, we have experience, and this is what we build uh, the following slide on. If you choose a file system, then let's first look uh, where you come from. Is it a new file system that you want to create, or is it an existing file system? If it is a new file system, your next question is, where do you want to use this file system for? So that's what, we, what I call the purpose. Is it for the operating system? In this case, ButterFS is what we prefer and what we suggest people to use today already and obviously also in our next major release of the enterprise product and also sometime in OpenSUSE when the community agrees to that step. Um, if you have data, then you have to, the choice, do you want to do snapshots or don't you do, want to do snapshots? In that case that you want to do snapshots, obviously you have to do ButterFS if you are not using other technologies like um, storage-based snapshots or device mapper-based snapshots. If you don't want to do snapshots, then our advice is to use XFS. I will come in the next minute to reasoning for this choice. Now let's talk about file system when you don't have a new file system, um, then it is a question of which type of file system you already have deployed in your infrastructure. And there are uh, three op options. You have XFS already, you might stay with that. It's a very good choice. Um, you have deployed XT2, 3, or 4. Then we are back to the question, do you want snapshotting? Uh, sorry, on, you have RiserFS. Uh, in the case of RiserFS, I will uh, we suggest to convert, and I will come to that later, sorry. If you have ext2, 3, and 4, you have the question again if you want to do snapshotting or not. If not, just stay with what you have. 
if you want to have snapshots on ext2, 3, or 4 file systems, you can go the conversion way and also use ButterFS going forward. I will demonstrate later how this conversion works. Now, I promise to talk about XFS, and I also will comment if ButterFS is mature and if it is good enough to be deployed as an operating system basis for you and also for our customers. Now, first, why XFS is a good thing. It is very mature. It is a true Unix file system uh, coming from the SGI IRIX operating system, has been ported to Linux more than 10 years ago, uh, is supported in SUSE's flavors of Linux community and enterprise since then. Uh, and we have very good experience with that together with our customers and partners who deploy it into large scales. It has a track record in performance, scalability, and also in stability. And it has an active development community. It got checksums uh, on the data um, just uh, recently. And it also has self-identifying metadata so that if you have metadata blocks and data blocks um, and the file system has issues with itself, you are not lost anymore and you will be able to recover the file system. Uh, this is, uh, I think, enough reasons uh, to say why um, but, uh, XFS is the right file system uh, for data when you are not using snapshots. Now, let's go to ButterFS. It's one of these religious questions, in my perspective, if ButterFS is mature enough or not, if you should use it or not. We say that you can use it and that you should use it if you want to do snapshots on your operating system or if you want to have snapshots on specific data sets. However, ButterFS has many features, as you see here, many, many functionality, and it is true that a number of those functionalities are not yet ready for enterprise use. We have separated this um, with our kernel and file system team, and um, there is a proposal to the upstream ButterFS community to build in an infrastructure to be able to mark those features as supported or not. The definition what is supported or not, or mature or not, obviously is also sometimes a feeling. Uh, situation. We are confident, though, that those things that we list on the left side are mature and supportable and ready for everybody to use. And this contains copy on write. It contains snapshots based on copy on write. And it also uh, contains the subvolume infrastructure. Also, the checksums on data and metadata are an essential part of ButterFS and very mature. Uh, as is the online metadata scrubbing. So scrubbing means the file system controls itself if everything is correct and if um, the metadata um, are in sync with what is found on the disk. A re just recently added functionality uh, is the manual deduplication. Sorry, I skipped the defrag. That is also available for some time already and stable. Um, the manual deduplication has just recently been added. It works primarily in user space. The manual in front of deduplication here uh, sets a differentiation to automatic or um, deduplication. Let me describe the difference just quickly. Manual defragmentation means you have the ButterFS file system, you write it, um, deduplication, you write it, and you will create duplicates on the disk because multiple people write the same PDF thousand times to the disk. Um, now, if the administrator of the system decides um, that there is a time of low usage of the system, for example, a storage system on the weekend in a company, uh, then he can run such a manual deduplication that will slow down the file system. The file system will be mounted and accessible, but certainly there will be a higher uh, latency because the other uh, stuff is running. 
automatic deduplication happens when you directly when you write a file or a block to the disk and obviously slows down the overall process of storing stuff and also of rec uh, receiving stuff from the file system because you always have to go through the file system, check if this is a duplicate or not. And this is why we are advising not to use automatic deduplication yet. And last but not least, uh, quota groups are also uh, supported and supportable. This means it's the way of ButterFS to implement quotas per user or per group or so. The um, challenge, though, is, and this is why it is listed separately, that on a copy on write file system, implementing quota is not that easy as you imagine. On a normal file system, you have one uh, file. It belongs to one person. And in that case, you can just measure how, how many uh, blocks or how much space uh, the specific user has, has used. In a copy on write file system, potentially with deduplication happened already, this is not so clear. Because what happens if two people have a very large files which only differentiate in 3%? Uh, so these 97%, do they belong to person A or person B, or do they belong to both? So that's, that's a real challenge here, to measure in the file system uh, what the real size is that a person has. And this is why the ButterFS community has implemented quota groups. They are uh, per subvolume, uh, where you then describe the size of a subvolume. This is what you can limit in a specific uh, set or configuration. On the right side of not yet mature functionality, there are some things which many people in the community or communities very often use and then report issues. The, the uh, primary things are rate and compression. Um, from our perspective, these two functionalities are not yet ready to be used in ButterFS, and we advise people not to do it. Uh, we also prevent people from doing it in our enterprise product actively, so they have to active overcome a, a switch uh, that they are aware that they're going onto uh, unexplored land. So rate is really not uh, what you want to use yet. And also compression is not on a level that we say this is something that we want to support at the moment. This um, functionality is already implemented in ButterFS. And over time, certainly this list will shorten and the list on the left side will be expanded so that we um, also declare stuff supported depending on uh, where we are with testing with our partners and customers. Later on, the customers then can be sure. That said, uh, that's uh, the first part. Uh, and now we go on copy and write and looking at uh, what we can do with that uh, as a practical thing. Do you have questions? Yes. Yes, yes, you have the same problem, um, but um, at least per subvolume, you can you can measure how much is used there. Um, I don't know. I don't ex know exactly. I do not know exactly the algorithm with it's used uh, to differentiate. But yes, you can have the same problem, um, and I don't know exactly if they count twice or half or what what they do. If, if you have interest, you can drop me an email, and I can find, can find out how it is calculated. But yes, that's if you do, do deduplication you in one file system with multiple subvolumes, so you definitely can have the same issue again. But you only have to, in this case, you only have to, to solve it once, and this is per subvolume, and that's much clearer than per user, which potentially has multiple files and multiple subvolumes. Yeah. Thank you. Good question. Other questions before I go ahead? One of the first things when we talked about internally about ButterFS and snapshotting was what can we do with that to manage an operating system better? 
and we uh, created an infrastructure called Snapper, uh, which is able to plug into uh, operating system tasks on multiple levels. So um, Snapper is an infrastructure, it's a tool, a user land tool to manage ButterFS snapshots. Uh, it can create, modify, and delete such snapshots. You can roll back snapshots, um, and you also can certainly clean up. You can also have an automated cleanup on those snapshots. It is integrated or can be integrated depending on the distribution uh, with the package management stack. So with YUM, there are patches for. Zipper is the OpenSUSE, SUSE Linux Enterprise tool chain for managing patches and packages. And it also can be integrated in the systems management stack. On SUSE, that is the Yast infrastructure. Other people have delivered other integrations. Snapper is a, uh, has several parts. It has a client library. It has a daemon, which uh, plugs into the Dbus system. Uh, so it is a Dbus service, which is available for every tool on the Linux system. And you, um, everybody can talk to it via this Dbus protocol. And there is also a command line tool, which I will show you certain, soon. But Snapper has its own website, snapper.io. And here you can download packages of Snapper for uh, all major uh, distributions, meaning uh, Debian, uh, RHEL, Fedora, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, uh, and uh, SUSE's Enterprise. Did I forget another major? I don't hope so. Just excuse if I forgot one. OK, so let's first have a demonstration about Snapper for administrative tasks. I'm, I'm using, uh, as an introduction, I'm using the graphical uh, interface um, to just create a user. Um, that's the, the easiest one, uh, what we can do. Um, so I just create a user, let's say, Celestine. Ah, I think this is right. Password doesn't matter today. Um, so, yeah, I used the wrong password, the weak password. Um, so now the user is created, uh, and once we have done so, uh, we can use um, the graphical interface to Snapper and, and see what has been done. We see here, Monday, um, it's uh, 10.38 in the evening. That's correct. That's local time Germany. And um, we, can, we can see what changes have been, uh, have been done to the system. And we see here that the group, password, and shadow files have been, have been touched and that Yast has created a uh, respective um, copy of these. So let's look at the, at the pass, uh, password file. I think that is, that is obvious. What has been done is the user Celestine A has been added to the system, user ID 1002, uh, group uh, 100. I think this is obvious. So Snapper uh, gives you an overview. I could roll back now. I don't do now. We do later uh, rollback test. Just uh, want to show you the same thing on the command line. Um, so snapper list gives you an overview uh, of the um, tasks that have been done and that have been uh, covered by snapper activities. You see here also pre and post. Uh, this is specific uh, actions that snapper can um, pair snapshots in a way that you later can compare them. Uh, you see here the users and Snapper itself as is integrated in Yast also has, has gotten a snapshot. Um, if we compare on the command line, um, it is called status um, 2 to 3. You see the same list that we have formerly seen on the, um, uh, on, on the graphical infrastructure. And you can also ask um, what the difference is on the command line for the password file. Uh, sorry. It's obvious the user Celestine has been added. Now um, let's roll back the whole thing. Just that you trust me. So Celestine is in. OK. Snapper, undo change. Everything from 2 to 3. Okay, and if we now grab Chalestine, it's not anymore. The files have been rolled back, and the user Chalestine <coughs> does not exist here anymore. In this case, the user has not yet been deleted. This would have been another task to integrate. Um, but I hope you trust me that this is what it really does. 
How is it done on the disk? Um, we have uh, specific snapshots, um, uh, sub-volume in this case, where the snapshots are just um, stored by number, and in this there are uh, XML information files, very quick and uh, easy, uh, which you then where you see when it is, has been created, uh, what has uh, requested the snapper to be active, and, uh, and so on. I also can create snapshots on the command line uh, very easily. Snapper create with a description of test uh, snapper list or with a additional I can modify um, say user data city equals New Orleans number six and then you see here on the right side, City New Orleans has been added as a key value pair. You can add arbitrary key value pairs such as this. Room is Celestin R. Okay. You can also modify that back again. Questions to that so far? Yes? Sorry again, what? I, I don't, I can't parse the name, the, 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 the roll, term. Roll forward? Roll forward. And that, uh, for example, line zero or sub-shell is in a snapshot environment. Like, if you know they've already profiled some variant changes, then I should roll, roll the snapshot. You can, you can, you can roll that into any direction. So I could also roll back uh, what I just have done uh, with the, uh, with the creation of the of the user, because I have the snapshots there, I can go in in any direction. Um, let me just try. Back, okay. You can go in any direction with that. You have the snapshots on the disk, and and then you can can call out the specific state. Uh, of the disk and, and, and get this. Okay? So that's what you wanted, right? More or less, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Other questions? Yeah? Um, so earlier you talked about having back to back pointers in your metadata. Yeah. Yeah, hard links, hard links, um, that's a good, good call out. The, um, when you, when, if you have hard links, then the number of back pointers from the extent multiply with every hard link. And yeah, back yes, and this indeed has been a problem in former versions of ButterFS. It's now fixed in the sense that if the number of um, back ne needed back pointers uh, exceeds the available space, then a new extent is, is used just for these back pointers. Uh, my personal thinking about this is if an, an application or an infrastructure need, uh, uses that huge uh, amount of uh, hard links um, one, and one really wants to use ButterFS, then it might be applicable to change the application and the environment to use ref links instead of hard links because that's the, the, uh, a way which matches with, with the functionality of ButterFS better than hard links. Yes, we have, we have, yes, we have, we have also SUSE internal uses, usage for massive amount of hard links. I can, I, I can confirm that. This was an issue, but it's fixed. Okay, so um, now the next thing is um, that obviously there are users uh, using Linux on the desktop, even if People always claim that this would nobody do, but uh, obviously I do as well. Um, and there, is, um, there are some requirements that you have to fulfill if you want to do that with ButterFS and Snapper included. Um, the user's home directory has to be in a separate ButterFS subvolume so that you can apply snapshots to it. Um, 
Then you need Snapper with the BBUS interface, which has been introduced earlier this year. And you need a Snapper configuration per user, where the root user has to define that this user is allowed to do snapshots on that specific subvolume. Um, this is uh, doable, and this is implemented in recent OpenSUSE and SUSE Enterprise versions. Uh, an additional benefit is, and I have to admit I'm a little bit proud of that, it's one of the few things I have programmed really in C the last years, uh, is that you can do automated snapshotting on login and log out via the PAM stack. And because I'm so proud about this, I will show you very easily. Um, so I have, I have created a user uh, called LinuxCon here. Uh, let's just uh, look at this, uh, at this configuration. It's etc. snapper, configs. Uh, uh, yeah, home Linux con. And you see here, uh, okay, yeah, you can read that. You see here that the user allowed to do snapshots on this specific configuration is the user Linux con. Um, now we can look at the configuration of this user this way. It's relatively empty except one suspend. Okay, and if I now uh, log in as the user Linux con, uh, it's one, two, three, four, five, by the way, uh, <laughs> uh, just for testing. Uh, home Linux con list. Okay, uh, so you see here that the PAM stack has uh, jumped in. Uh, we have done a snapshot uh, while we logged in. You see that the remote user was this and the service uh, which issued this was SU and it came from, um, from the physical terminal, uh, the Pseudo terminal 5. Uh, now, obviously, the user can also create a snapshot uh, with the description of test. Um, um, and we can look at this. And if I'm log out and now I'm root again, uh, then you see also here that we have paired this again. So we have here the snapshot 2, which is a pre. We have here the snapshot 4, which is a post. So these two things are paired. Now, when I did this, um, the complaint within SUSE was, OK, but nobody logs out and logs in and out anymore. Everybody snapshots. OK, and this is why you see the suspend there. That is just a simple shell script. Then if the system suspends, just a snapshot is, is done. And uh, so you can, you can also cover this, that whenever you, you put your system to sleep, that you, that you are snapshotting. OK, good. Let's, uh, this is available and uh, can, can be implemented everywhere where ButterFS is, is available. Did this. Now, I'm product manager for a server product. And obviously, the desktop use case is not of so huge interest for me. So it is more important to see also how the ButterFS and its capabilities, snapshots, and beyond can be used on server infrastructures. And one of these is that our Samba guys went down, took Snapper and ButterFS, and thought about what can we do better in the Samba infrastructure uh, based on what we already have. And they came down with the uh, replacement uh, of, a copy, of the copy system in Samba to make it more look like a real Windows server in the back end. A traditional file copy in Samba does the following. You tell the system to copy a file. The file is copied from the disk to the Samba server, goes over the wire to the client system, the Windows system in this case, goes back to the Samba server and back to the disk. Hmm. You have storage transfer, and you have network transfer. Not really good. The first thing about what you can do better is that you avoid the uh, network transfer. So the Samba server realizes, oh, something is copying locally here. Um, but uh, so you avoid the network transfer. OK, that's already a big plus. The real trick is now to avoid also all the storage transfers from the storage to the Samba server and back by simply doing a copy based on a, a so-called reflink copy in, in ButterFS. So what you do is it's a clone copy. Um, if a server-side copy is requested, it's just cloned uh, on the disk so that you don't have any 
thing moving instead of, in, instead of a few metadata blocks or kilobyte or whatever, and you have a really fast copy transaction uh, in, from your Windows uh, system uh, with the Samba server as a backend. That is enabled and in recent Samba 4 uh, releases. The second thing is now going to the Snapper uh, infrastructure again. So this was just ButterFS. Now back, coming to the uh, Snapper infrastructure again, um, you use Snapper as a backend to Samba to do snapshots and present them in Windows as recovery points. Uh, this is similar to what you have just seen with the snapshots on the disk or on, in Linux with the, with the user or with the administrator. Um, you can uh, do this. Also, that is implemented in recent Samba snapshots and Samba 4 upstream, uh, where the Samba talks uh, via the uh, Dbus interface to the snapper, uh, doing a snapshot or receiving the snapshot data and then being able to give the right version back to the end customer on his Windows system. There is a YouTube, uh, on YouTube there is a video about how this works uh, to prove also that it works. Okay. Other features um, which are, might be in the future, uh, not all, uh, other features are conversion to and from uh, ButterFS, more to ButterFS, uh, and that's my last demonstration uh, very quickly convert a RiserFS uh, to ButterFS. So, um, first we need a some file system. Um, So that is now 256 megabytes, right? Okay, rise of S. Yeah. So you see now we have a, raw de uh, a loop device created, which is a uh, RiseFS file system. I just create a small uh, text file here, which says LinuxCon 2013 New Orleans. And uh, I hope you trust me that I did the right thing and not so new mount. Now I have my small file system here, just do a butterfs convert this one, and now I mount it again, and we check what file system this is, and now it's a butterfs, and surprisingly what you see if you look at this uh, file system, then you see not only the file test.txt that I have created, but you see also something called risefs saved, and an image there, and this image is the real interesting thing on the whole operation. If, uh, because if you l mount this image, then you see that is a RiserFS. So what happens during the conversation, the conversion from RiserFS to ButterFS is that the metadata of the whole RiserFS file system are concentrated and are saved in one file, which is this image. Um, so if you are um, mounting this uh, image, then you see all the metadata information that you have from the riser file system, and in fact you could also uh, convert back uh, from from a riser uh, from a butterfs file system to a riser uh, file system. I will uh, do that now very quickly. Um, butterfs convert. And we do the mount check again. And you see it's, a, it's back as a RiserFS. The same also works with ext2, 3, and 4. It works in place but offline, so the file system cannot be mounted during that operation. And if you, if you revert back what I just have done, you will lose all data that you have put on the file system while it was a 
ButterFS file system, obviously, because those data was not available to the um, RiserFS before, or to the XT2, 3, and 4. Okay. Um, snapshot full rollback for the full system uh, will come in the, in the near future. We are working on uh, patches to GRUB2, um, which help um, the GRUB2 to directly boot uh, from a ButterFS snapshot. Um, so the use case for that is if people installing a new kernel, that's what most people I know uh, fear and are anxious about, myself included, um, that you directly can say, okay, I want to keep the old configuration, including kernel, make uh, the init RD, the whole configuration and everything, and you can directly go back to that stage just in case the new kernel that you installed fails. And that's the real thing that we are targeting for, for next year. Uh, and certainly we're working on stuff like how to delete the, right, the, the snapshots and, and so on. That's the real trick then because you might create bigger Data deduplication, I already talked about. Manual deduplication uh, has been upstreamed this week, uh, so just three days ago. Uh, it, th this came in when the presentation already was ready, but <laughs> yeah, I added it quickly. Summary is that the file system recommendation now, I hope, is a little bit more obvious why we are suggesting XFS if you don't want to do uh, snapshotting and why we are suggesting ButterFS specifically for the operating system, but also for data. And with that, uh, I wish you a uh, ha lot of fun to try out ButterFS and also Snapper. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my question is around uh, recommendations for file systems. Mm -hmm. So you have your impressive chart that recommends which file system to use, and you recommend Butter file system for OS and for data. But in one of your first slides, you had mentioned virtualization. Yes. And that ButterFS uh, uh, is not necessarily a good file system for uh, serving images for virtual machines. Correct. Do you have a recommendation for that purpose? Yes. There are two options that you can use. And I said here if you want snapshots or not. If you want snapshots for your virtual machines, you have to use uh, ButterFS, at least from our perspective. Um, then you have to eat the frog that it might run into, defragmenta into fragmentation and thus slower. The other option is to use XFS directly. That would be the recommendation. There is a midway. The midway is that you can turn off the copy on write on the specific virtual machine image, losing the copy on write functionality but keeping your ButterFS. Uh, this is also what you, what you could do. Um, my recommendation for storing virtual machine images so if it's really image-based, is XFS still? If you, but if you want to, to, if you want snapshots, I mean, then, then you have the one. But the question is valid. Yes, other question? So if if you have a, a large, say, a several terabyte file system, has uh, the conversion been tested on, on that? Does it take? Uh, because it's only working with metadata, does it take a very short amount of time, or does it take a few hours for a file system, say an ext4 file system that's of two or three terabytes? Sorry, again, for the conversion? So if, if, you're, if you're converting from ext4 to, uh, B, uh, to, to ButterFS, um, if it's a multi-terabyte file system, is it a very slow operation, or is it uh, relatively quick? So the, I, I can't give you any numbers. The, the, real, um, the real question is not the amount of data on the file system, but on the amount of metadata. That's the real trick. Because the metadata is converted, the data is not touched. The data remains in place, and only the metadata is, uh, is converted into, into something suitable for ButterFS. So y if you have 50 million files on it, it might take some hours. <laughs> yes? Hi. Um, question about uh, snapshotting. So is there any sort of limit how many snapshots can I have? And uh, if I have many, many snapshots, like hundreds of them, will there be any sort of performance hit? And also, is it more expensive to snapshot large file systems, like multi-terabyte file systems? So the, the ex expensiveness of a snapshot depends, uh, does not depend on the, on the file of the file system size, but it really depends on the amount of changes that you have done while you are, while you are snapshotting. That, that's the same for small and for big file systems. Rick, Rick, you have a comment? Yeah, I was going to say that about converting file systems, 
Yeah. You would not. We we think that it is that it is good to go, but yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the other the other part of the question was. Um, yeah. So there is um, there is no limit. The only thing with respect to the number of um, snapshots is, and this is what you also can control in Snapper. Uh, the number of the, the size of um, of the snapshots and the, the additional size that you have that you don't run out of space on the file system because with mul with hundreds or thousands of snapshots and a lot of changes on your files obviously even if your files are small you can run out of space quickly sorry how many how many billion are those <laughs> thank you Thanks, Christoph. Yeah. Um, so, how guaranteed is the instant instantaneousness of snapshots? Because, um, like, I'm looking at particularly the ability to use a snapshot to make a copy of a Postgres database. I'm used to ZFS, where the sort of instantaneousness of it is guaranteed by the intent log, but you're using a different method in ButterFS. Yeah. So, um, the uh, instantaneousness with respect to a, the database needs. Uh, at the database to be to be frozen at least that's that's why what, what I know because there is no direct uh, ability to um, from the file system to reach to the rest of the system to, to freeze something so if you want to snapshot the database the advice would be to to put the database in a hold status most databases allow those uh, then snapshot and then and then release the, the freeze again um, it is, it is an atomic operation from the perspective of the, of the uh, application, but it's not atomic enough because you never know in, in which state your application is in that case. Yeah, I, I think that that's good to perceive as well. Yes. That, that was misunderstood, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, the snapshot per se is atomic, but the, um, the amount of space that it needs, that is, uh, is not, is not um, relative to the size of the file system, but rel relative to the size of the changes that you do on it, or have done on it. Yeah. Okay, I think we have to stop after this question. Okay, well, one question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah? Uh, as I know, some developers working on uh, Riser VS earlier currently are involved in better FS de development. And additionally, as I know, uh, Razer VFS uh, features are, uh, Razer VFS features and better butter FS features are common. Does it mean that uh, butter FS uh, source bases on? Uh, Razer FS, or it is written completely from scratch. I, I don't. I didn't understand the question. Sorry, again. Oh, all right. What What was the question? Uh, as I As I know, yeah. uh, some developers working on uh, Razer FS currently are involved in Better FS yes. development. Yeah. Does it mean that uh, Better FS uh, source is based on uh, Razer FS, or no. it is completely it's written completely from scratch? Completely written from scratch. Okay. It's written from scratch, but it's the same people. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome.